Welcome, everybody. I'm Dr. Howard Coe. I'm very pleased to welcome you to a new video series entitled, What CEOs Say, co-sponsored by the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the Harvard Business School with support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Our overall goal is to explore how the private sector can leverage its resources to promote health and well-being for society. And in particular, we want to meet business leaders who have committed to promoting a culture that advances health for employees, consumers, communities, and or the environment. We want to hear from leaders about how they made that commitment, what changes they've made, the challenges they faced and how they overcame them, and the lessons learned that they want to share with others. Thank you for joining us. I am delighted to be here with Gary Hirschberg, a CEO and now a COO, a, what is it? Ch Chief Organic Optimist. Chief yes. Organic Optimist, <clears throat> best title ever. Um, but I can't think of anybody who exemplifies this mission better than you. Mm. But before we get into that mission, I think we need to go to the origin story of Stonyfield because it wasn't always a top brand or a top organic brand. So can maybe you take us back, and there's a great quote you have. You say, we had a great company in the early days, no supply and no demand. Right. <laughs> Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, the area you're talking about, Karen, is 1983. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, it's fair to say at that point in history, organic meant that you had to chew extra. Right, I mean, the dark and dirty organic kind natural. of cardboard. Yeah, yeah. this the mm -hmm. moths are flying on the broccoli. I mean, it was a lot of well, we were a, a lot of well-intentioned uh, counterculture sort of challenge uh, uh, the status quo folks, but we weren't necessarily uh, thinking about the end, the consumer. We're, it was a supply-driven phenomena, like most movements and and, and most new uh, categories. Um, and so we stumbled and bumbled a lot. Um, we were actually an organic farming school uh, before we started. We were a 501c3 nonprofit, and I often say that we uh, would not exist without Ronald Reagan because his uh, first day, literally first afternoon cuts right after he was inaugurated, went right to the heart of uh, organic research funding and renewable energy funding, all the things that our little nonprofit were depending on. And so the tightening up of federal support meant that uh, any nonprofit that wanted to uh, get through that had to come up with means of self-support. Uh, my partner had one cow at the little farming school. I was actually on his board uh, of trustees, and we would uh, go up to these meetings and uh, eat this absolutely incredible yogurt. Um, this was right after the Iranian hostage crisis. An Iranian a refugee had resettled in our local town, and she drove up one day saying, this is the best thing she's had since the old country, and we should call it a taste of Iran. Of course, you know, Ayatollah Khomeini was on the front page of the, every newspaper <laughs> saying, down with America. Um, but um, nonetheless, he had this extraordinary ambrosia-like yogurt that was unlike anything out there. Uh, and, and, and the problem with that, of course, is that to get it into a cup, which is what we decided to do to make up to replace the federal support, uh, we couldn't, most yogurts out there were three for a dollar. There were maybe two brands out there. It was there, there was actually, they were loaded with sugar. It was a kind of a, Americans have not grown up as a, with a yogurt culture, unlike most of the rest of the world, no pun intended. Uh, and uh, so we loaded it with sugar. So there was actually more sugar in a Snickers, in, 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 a, in typical yogurts, uh, Dannon and Yoplait in those days, than, than in a Snickers bar. So we were launching this product that had low or actually no sugar, in fact, when we started, uh, cream on top, whole milk. We could not get it in a cup and to a store at less than about 75% mm, premium to what was going on in the market. So people looked at us and said, what is this stuff and what are you talking about? But we fought and clawed our way through. It, it, did, it, it was a, a, an unprecedented taste experience. And of course, there was our whole message, which we tried like a Dr. Bronner's bottle to you know, cram onto every uh, part of our of package, type, talking yeah. about our mission for uh, so soil carbon sequestration, things that we talk about today that are even the stuff of current presidential campaigns. But in those days, it was all foreign. You know, I've known you a long time, and your wife has this story about being on the top of a hill in the winter 
and somehow the farm ended up on the uh, top of a hill with no insulation in the farmhouse well, with the wind whipping through. Yeah, what were those through is like? the right word. It, it, I mean, the, our the hair would blow in the, the winter <laughs> indoors. Meg, what, what, so you have to picture this is a 1792 federal style farmhouse, Stonyfield Farm, on top of a hill that mostly our best crop was the annual stones that came up each year with the, with the frost heaves. And uh, the last place on earth you want to have a, a factory of any sort. There was a dirt road that got narrower and narrower, and at the very top it took a 90 degree turn. Good for the trucks. Oh, I mean, I spent probably, if I wasn't raising capital during this uh, improbable run, I was digging out trucks. That was what we did. Um, but the house was, yeah, it was 1792. It was corn cobs were the insulation, and so by, of course, 1983, there was no, there were no corn cobs left, and and it was also wood heated. So uh, we had, you know, probably 20 cords of wood that we'd go through. And my poor wife would kind of live as close to the wood stove as she could. She would lean over when she, when in the middle of all this craziness, we thought it was a good idea to have babies. She became pregnant, and her she would, all of her maternity clothes were singed um, on the front because she was <laughs> leaning, because it was freezing up there. Uh, and the, the, the warmest place was the yogurt room because that's where we pasteurized the milk to 190 degrees. And so uh, this is how I basically manipulated her into being one of our yogurt makers. Mm. Uh, yes. Mm. Now, um, there is a tale about how you funded this. I'm teaching entrepreneurship now at Harvard Business School, mm -hmm. so we want to make sure everybody knows it's not a straight rise <laughs> to be the next Google, right? Mm. You know. um, how did you fund all this? Well, I think uh, you may be referring to my original venture capitalists, which was a group of Catholic nuns, the Sisters of Mercy. Uh, they. No, you're serious. I'm. I'm actually completely yes. serious. No, he's serious. Yeah, and mercy might have been the right word too in this case. Uh, so, a, 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 an order of nuns in New Hampshire had sold their large monastery and a uh, big, very nice piece of real estate, and they decided to. Uh, convert those dollars into local community self-support, trying to help grassroots businesses that would redistribute wealth in the community. And uh, my partner, uh, the again, who had created this farming school, um, uh, appealed to them, and uh, we were able to secure a $35,000 loan um, to build this yogurt company. And uh, it was a fa fabulous deal because we got not only 35000 but we also got a nun because uh, one of them was a bookkeeper. And she came, so, and they weren't about to give this crazy, hippie, organic yogurt guy uh, money without you know, watching it. So, so when I arrived, Sister Louise uh, Foisy was right there, uh, you know, counting, the, counting the acorns. And of course, the other part of that story is that, uh, you know, I, my wife describes me, but I would also describe my partner as a pathological optimist. And, you know, the 30, you, you all know that, you know, the, the, the rule with entrepreneurs is that we have the cost that we think it's going to actually be, and we, we, we double the revenues we think we're going to get. And so he, of course, the $35,000, he really needed about $100,000. But, but so by the time I got there on, on day one, because he, he, he started the company about four months earlier, I was wrapping up my duties running another nonprofit down in Cape Cod. And when I arrived, um, there, there were desks, he had just, just been milking cows and making yogurt, and there were desks piled high with envelopes. And I said, okay, I'm gonna spend my first morning separating out the checks from the, the bills. Well, you know, by lunch, we were $75,000 in the hole. There were no checks. He could <laughs> smell the check, and he would use it to buy feed for the cows or cups or, uh, but there, there, and literally we were 75K in the red and, and tanking, and this, uh, you know, uh, the nun who was with us was not m not much pleased by all of that. So I did what any self-respecting entrepreneur did on, on day one. I called my mother and uh, <laughs> borrowed another uh, $30,000 from her and gradually pieced this thing together. And thus began, the, the irony of this story is that I left the nonprofit Your mother world. Well then, 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 well, then we'll get to the mother-in-law in a moment. I know where you're going. Yes. Mm -hmm. you, these are all I'm going you know, there. The, the key women who made all of this happen, the nuns, my mom, my mother-in-law, they were all, you know, deities to me, but... Um, financing. The women are financing this. Yeah, I just want to make this Yeah, point. utterly. Yes. Well, we'll, yeah, we'll get to that one. But, but w w what was ironic about this period is that I had left, you know, we had a nonprofit farming school. I left my own nonprofit to, because I was tired of raising money. 
And what every entrepreneur needs to understand is that that's what you're stepping into. And that's really what I did for nine years because given all these improbabilities, it took us nine years to, to make money. And of course, we made millions of mistakes. So um, the mother-in-law part, uh, I hadn't actually yet then yet my, uh, met, met my, uh, my soon-to-be uh, wife, but I did meet her. I was keynoting an organic farming conference the following summer. We had managed to borrow... Uh, you know, bridge monies to make up this first deficit, and then we had another deficit. And, uh, you know, this was one of these situations where the UPS guy didn't like to come on Thursdays for fear I'd hit him up for a loan, because <laughs> Thursday was payroll day. And this was a constant hemorrhage, because, again, we were, again, I, I've already described, we were pathologically optimistic. We, and you were breaking new ground. Well, literally. we were breaking new ground and, and burning a lot of cash. And uh, although little did I know, that was a drop in the bucket compared to what came later. Um, but I met my, my uh, fiance uh, and the eventual wife at this conference, and um, I brought yogurt down to meet the mother-in-law, or the eventual mother-in-law, and she fell in love with the yogurt, uh, which is also, by the way, how I, found, how I won my wife's heart. She loved our maple. Uh, and she was running an organic farm in New Jersey, and I would fly down on People Express, because $19 flights for those you're all too young to remember. Alice remembers. Um, but uh, that was the only way I could afford to fly down. But I would bring these cases of um, maple yogurt down. And actually, John McPhee, the author, was her next door neighbor. And he actually said very nice things about us, which helped me to raise more money. This was all, Everything was a way to raise money, right? That's what it was all about. But eventually, Doris, my mother-in-law, really, uh, as if you listen to the How I Built This podcast on on NPR, you will hear her critical role. Eventually, she got in far deeper than not only uh, she ever should have, but al also far deeper than my wife ever knew because we ended up keeping secrets. We, 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 <laughs> my bedroom was about 50 feet from the office, which was about 50 feet from the yogurt works. And thinking my wife was asleep on most nights, uh, I would tiptoe over, especially Wednesday nights before payroll, to the office to see if, call my mother-in-law. These were all landlines. Uh, to see if we could, um, I could borrow another thousand or two thousand to help meet payroll, and I would hear the click click of call waiting on the other side, and my my wife was calling from our bedroom saying, "Mom, don't do this." <laughs> um, and Doris's line, which went on for nine years, we say it today, was, uh, "Maggie, I'm a big girl. I know what I'm doing. This is going to work out." But from those early days, uh, due to a calamity that happened in 1987, we wound up. Going about three and a half million into the um, into the red. I mean, we, we we dipped in about three and a half million of capital. And the problem is, is that no institutional investors would give us the time of day. It was a category. It didn't. The category didn't exist. Didn't exist. Our, our gross margins were anemic, and our pricing was you know just at an enormous premium. Um, the only thing that kept us going was that individual consumers, like that Iranian woman, were just passionate about us. People um, wanted the product and they wanted the story. Who's pulling it through. Yeah. So I'm going to come back to mm -hmm. the success and you and the mother-in-law being right. But I want to go to something Cute. else that was going on mm -hmm. in that time period. Mm -hmm. And you started at that time, um, and I actually um, remember this, you started something called Climate Counts. And it was the first time that people actually put a metric on their footprint, on their climate footprint, print, maybe their carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. How did you, t tell us about that. How did you decide to put numbers around this set of issues? Yeah. So the, con the context, a huge impact. yeah, the context here is that, you know, we never really left our nonprofit roots. This was a mission driven company from the start. And we were my my actual academic background is in dendroclimatology, which I could take three hours and explain to you sometime. But next time. But yes, but um, <laughs> I'll spare you. But uh, we were very committed to not only proving that there was a place in the market for uh, truly preventative health products. In other words, food that should not only be bad for your health but actually enhance your health, because that's in the end the cheapest form of health care there is. Right, not getting sick. We were also committed to doing this in a way that uh, was uh, car at least carbon neutral, or certainly proving that it could be profitable to not be uh, to be reversing our uh, uh, commerce's adverse impacts on climate. 
Um, the problem is, is that in those days, and even today to some extent, carbon footprint metrics is a very subjective science. Um, it depends, if, you are, if you're really honest about it, in my case it would depend on what the cows ate that day. And you couldn't come up with a standard metric that would average that out and still be honest. And what we came to realize uh, was, as, and now I'm in the CPG world, right? I'm out not just educating um, uh, uh, students or, 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 or uh, uh, consumers, but I'm actually selling to consumers. And what we were, what our bet was that the consumer who uh, could associate a brand with a cause that they cared about would be a more loyal consumer. And just to say a word about that, the holy grail of, of consumer of CPG is loyalty. Um, we, you can get there by spending an enormous amount of money on reach and frequency and building uh, uh, awareness that leads to trial, that leads to repeat trial, that leads to purchase, that leads to repeat purchase. You can go through this whole ladder and it's very expensive. And of course, we didn't have that kind of money. We couldn't afford advertising. So we had to do uh, things that were free or cheap. And so we put cows up for adoption. You could get a certificate naming, you would send in five yogurt tops uh, by mail. Remember mail? You licked it. But, uh, they would send in five yogurt tops. Uh, they would get a certificate naming them the co-owner of their cow. They would get a photograph of their cow, and then their cow would send them two letters a year in those days. <laughs> Nowadays, they, they blog and they tweet. But they, in those days, it was, and the cows would talk about what they were eating and why their methane production was low. I mean, we were having a real conversation. But what we ascertained, to come to your question, Karen, mm -hmm. is that uh, what the consumer really cared about was the intention. You know, whether you produced uh, 40,000 metric tons of carbon or 39,000 was not something that really impacted a consumer's decision. What, what the consumer cared about is, d does this company really care? And so what we did was we set up a 74-question survey that assigned points that we would invite brands and we created a category so it would be electronics, uh, retailers, and we would s uh, ask the retailers, do you care to fill out this survey? We will then give you a score that actually measures your intention. And, uh, and, and we created a nonprofit that did this. This is while raising money, you know, not telling my mother and my daughter, my wife, what my mother-in-law was investing, and making yogurt and selling. And milking the cows. Milking the cows, all of that. Well, actually, we'd stopped milking the cows at that point. We were buying milk by then. But the point is, is that um, this was really a part of the, uh, sort of testing this hypothesis, which I, I must say uh, has been proven, uh, the, uh, particularly with this millennial consumer today who has, and, and by the way, you might extrapolate and say this millennial voter uh, today also. I'm in New Hampshire after all. This is all we're talking about. But this consumer, as never before, is demonstrating um, that they can move markets. And of course, organic in general, as we leap to from 1980, the 1980s to, the, to almost 2020, um, you, can, you can't find a category where organic isn't growing faster than, than the mainstream. I'm Karen is well aware because uh, you're involved with it. I'm on a board of an organic beer company. I'm, I'm, in, I'm, I'm on many organic, in many sectors. Yes. And in every case, we've got high singles or double digits in categories that are often even shrinking. And that's even true you know, with this dairy. Is, this is really, I think, something um, which I celebrate uh, uh, and honor you for. Um, one of my investments was Annie's Macaroni and Cheese when it was eight people in Annie. And it was just at the time that there was an organic certification. So this now category, everybody thinks it was always here, but it was <laughs> really scraping at yeah. that time. Yeah. All right, I want to fast forward. And now forward. it's General Mills. Yes. Yeah. So this, this is exactly uh, where I want to go, which is you eventually sold this company. And a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, they think of their company as their baby. We say, is it Still your baby do. or... Uh, <laughs> or your house, you know, you can sell your house, but you don't want to sell your baby. But you made a decision that you thought you could have more impact as part of a larger company. And you kept a very big share of your money mm -hmm. riding inside. You got your mother-in-law and the investors a bunch of their money back, but you let the chips ride for a while and then you took a bigger role, a worldwide role around this mission. Talk about yeah. that for us. 
Yeah, so in 1999, having uh, finally made money, started to make money in 1992, and just to give you all a sense of the parameters, so 1992, we broke even at around $10 million in annual sales. By uh, 1999, we were at about $100 million in sales and growing 19.5% annually. So the, this was on a, and of course, growth is cash consumptive, so I was um, now generating a lot of capital but still needing to raise to build infrastructure and so on. I also had 297 uh, mother-in-laws. I mean, I had 297 investors, some of whom were uh, farmers who I had uh, gone to when they I couldn't pay them for their milk, and I, I asked them if they would take stock instead of buying milk. Of course, telling a farmer would they take stock, I had to explain exactly what I meant. Uh, but I had individuals, friends, former Ultimate Frisbee team members. I had, you know, anybody with a necktie was fair game in my day, right? I was always raising. So I had this large group, and of course now, I mean, some had been in for 16, 17 years. They, they didn't have kids at the time. Now they were facing orthodontics and college tuition bills. And these are real people. And by the way, this whole friends and family thing is, you know, it, it works, right? The reason VCs, private equity folks, want you to have your friends and family money is, is that during the dark days, I, I might very well have walked, given some of the pain we were going through. But when it's your mother-in-law and your friends and your Frisbee teammates, you, you don't walk. You, you just double down. And so I needed to get them an exit, but I certainly had no desire to leave. But Karen is right. I, um, I also uh, really believe that we had proven this hypothesis, that this, this notion that uh, we could be uh, commercializing uh, preventative health care uh, creating what I call win-win-win-win commerce, right? Our farmers were, and today it's even more so, they were, our organic farmers were profitable. Conventional farmers have not been profitable now for seven or eight years. You may know conventional farmers in the Northeast are basically an endangered species. Uh, the consumer was winning with pesticide-free food. Our soil carbon sequestration was incredible. Our carbon footprints were, you know, environmental impacts were positive. Our employees were all participating in profits and equity. Uh, really, everybody, the investors were obviously doing well. And many, many companies by then were starting to sniff around. But I sort of wanted to turn that on its head because what I realized is the reason they were sniffing around is that this proposition, I thought, could be marshaled to take what we were doing to a much larger scale. And so here was Danone. And by the way, Danone was one of a dozen uh, Fortune 100s who came knocking at our door. Um, and, uh, uh, but in the end, Danon, as you know, the owners of Danon and, and Evian, uh, they uh, and I worked out a deal that uh, most people still say is impossible, but, and it's a credit to Danon's chairman and CEO that we did it. Um, I sold them 80% of the company in two stages, but uh, I retained 60% uh, voting control. And the reason, the way I did that, just to share a little trade secret here, is they had, by, by um, gap rules, they had to demonstrate to outsiders that they actually had control. Um, so they got three board seats and I had two. But one, we stipulated that one of their three would always be me. And so uh, it's as simple as that. And I share the secret because that's, it was a win for them and a win for us because we then took the company over the subsequent uh, 12 years, while I still remained CEO, we took it from 100 million to uh, about 400 million in sales using some of their know-how and technology, but also, frankly, I was now free from worrying about 297 shareholders and I could be all in with the business. I also became head of something called uh, Stonyfield Europe under Danone. We launched what is now Danone's fastest growing brand in the world called Les Devaches in France. It's an organic brand. And we launched a bunch of other organic enterprises. Um, this was all going swimmingly until we came up with this brilliant idea of buying White Wave Foods, which is the owners of Horizon and Silk and others. And um, the, uh, the um, uh, Justice Department decided this was a, the consolidation of organic milk uh, under one entity would be too much, so they forced Danone to divest Stonyfield. Ironically, by the way, the same week we announced our intention to buy White Wave, uh, Bayer announced its intention to buy Monsanto. That one went through. Uh, $160 billion conglomeration of chemical and pesticide companies. But that's another discussion for another day. But uh, nonetheless, what ended up happening ended up being quite fortuitous because uh, 
uh, Danone was forced to sell, and in, in the end, a very large private company called Lactalis. It's actually the largest dairy company in the world, but it's two brothers and a sister. It's a private company now uh, acquired Stonyfield, which, having lived in a public company environment for 12 years, again, prosecuting all these mission-driven notions, um, I have to say it's been a relief to be in a private environment. I'm back in as a active, uh, you know, chief organic optimist, and we're driving right. mission as never before. You, uh, on that point, you, you said earlier, uh, you have influence without responsibility. Right, the that holy does, grail. <laughs> does sound yeah. appealing, doesn't it? Okay, <laughs> that, that is the, all right, I'm gonna switch gears again, mm -hmm. because you have something else that I wanna talk about, um, which is an effort that you have undertaken because you are a soccer player, you're a soccer coach, your kids are soccer players, quite good, mm. and you notice that the playing fields uh, that they were playing on may not be as healthy as they mm -hmm. needed to be. Yeah. And so tell us about playing fields all over America. Yeah. What's this effort that you're So this is in? a good example of what I was just saying about the freedom under a private company environment here. Uh, you know, we have proven a lot of things during our trajectory. Uh, one of the things we've proven is that farmers can have uh, uh, equivalent yields with a completely chemical-free environment. In fact, the yields over time, as you put soil, more carbon into the soil, which is exactly the point of organic, right, composting and so forth, you actually enhance fertility, you enhance biological soil health, and you actually get higher yields with lower labor inputs and better water consumption. Uh, be better water uh, 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 retention, and in fact, in drought periods, as we're now experiencing, particularly in California and other parts, uh, organic systems hold up much, much better. And we've had side-by-side -side trials for 30 years showing that organic fields are more resilient and you get do get higher yields. So this whole idea that organic can't fi feed the world is just a myth perpetrated by people who want to sell you chemicals instead. But but while that I just explained that in 45 seconds. That's a lot to put on a package, right, to explain to consumers. And average consumers uh, really just think of organic as being no pesticides. But, but soil health is the key that I just shared with you because it, the only way we're going to uh, ultimately reverse climate change, because now it's no longer about stopping or slowing it, we actually have to take carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back in, is going to be with organic systems. So uh, at the same time, we have this health crisis now going on, as you just allude, mm -hmm. Karen. Uh, pesticide, I mean, I mean, there are herbicides out there that the U.S. Geological Survey now shows us are in 90 to 100 percent of the rainfall. These are carcinogens. Uh, they, they are known to a impa adversely impact brain development, even in utero. Uh, children born in, uh, in, uh, on, on, in, on, in farm or environments where these chemicals are being used actually have lower IQ. This is peer-reviewed, published medical stuff, no less than JAMA, uh, Journal of the American Medical Association, has, 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 has published these um, kinds of reports. So we have a, a crisis uh, of, of a, cli a climate crisis and a toxification crisis. And in my work as an ecologist, I know uh, that roughly 70% of the playing fields and parks in this country are actually treated to a cocktail of one, two, or three herbicides, all of which are the same ones that we've been fighting in organic agriculture. And while consumers, uh, what you eat is critically important, what you put in your body, the reality is, is that we walk our dogs, our kids go out and play, um, we um, spend a lot of time in these parks, and our skin is the biggest organ in our body. So if you're diving for a soccer ball or your dog goes out and rolls around, and brings this stuff into your house, which is na mainly how the pesticides make their way into our homes, uh, you've got a, a problem here. And it turns out 26 million children are playing on these parks and fields uh, every day in this country. And so we have created something called Fields, where we've been adopting cities around the country and showing that this very same thing we've done with our agriculture on our farms we can do in these parks. Um, it, 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 uh, in Salt Lake City, I uh, kicked off of, uh, on a huge soccer complex with the mayor of that city. In Houston, we worked in um, the largest park in that city. And we've been demonstrating that by eliminating pesticides and herbicides and going to organic methods, we uh, actually can enhance soil health just as we do on our farms. Uh, and actually, we, reduce, uh, we, we, we save the city's money. By year three, mm. the, the fields require less water, less labor, and so forth. 
And um, it's very interesting that uh, now, uh, as we enter 2020, 16 of our largest retailers have now adopted the program around the country. They're, they're partnering with us. And, and we actually have a waiting list of cities who want to do this. We're not the only ones doing this, but we're using our brand to shine a light on this. And it's an incredibly exciting development because, again, uh, it's not just how we eat. It's how we live, right? If we're going to reverse climate change and, and, and avoid... Uh, these uh, toxins, it, it, we have to op operate in a 360-degree manner. Apparently, you picked 35 cities. Yeah, to celebrate our 35th birthday, right. It's the 35th Thir birthday thir of the brand. Uh, yes, Stonyfield a, a, a year ago was the 35th. So we're, we're now uh, about, we have about 20 of those cities. We have 15 more that we'll do this year. but. We have probably 100 cities who'd like to join us. So we're working with a cohort of a number of different nonprofits beyond pesticides and others. There's a group called Non-Toxic Neighborhoods, which began by a group of moms in Irvine, California, mm -hmm. who very successfully eliminated pesticides from their community. Uh, again, um, I guess this. I, what I'd like to say is, it, to cap this, is it goes to the, the, I think, one of the great lessons from Stonyfield, which is that uh, uh, you know, preventative health is... It works, uh, so whether it's soil health or people's health. Uh, you know, I neglected to say on our farms, we have more biodiversity. Our, our sugar farms, 400 species have returned to these farms who were otherwise not there because of pesticides and herbicides. So, so this is win-win-win economics. And of course, if you take it to scale and think about our country where, according to the president's cancer uh, panel that reported into your former boss, to, uh, Barack Obama, 41% of Americans alive today are going to be diagnosed with cancer in our lifetimes. And the primary cause of that that they've uh, Im implicated, uh, these are oncologists, not ecologists, is, is uh, inadvertent exposure to toxins in our everyday life. That's a multi-trillion dollar price tag for our country. We all know that most expensive way to deal with cancer, which is now sort of an epidemic, is is to be sick. It, preventative health is where it's at. So, so I, I I hope that the legacy here, not that we're giving up anytime soon, we're we're growing, and by the way, we're growing and gaining and share every day. Uh, we being Stonyfield, but we also being the organic sector. But I hope that people understand that that's really the legacy. It's it's a preventative health story more than uh, it is just a CPG story. Well, Dr. Coe is here, but. Um, I really can't think of a better example of these four pillars in the culture of health um, than what you've described. The consumer is happy, uh, there's an environmental, the employees, and the community as these pillars, and, and you've talked about uh, you've talked about all of them. Well, in, we can add story. a fifth, which is ah. the investment and financial community, right? right? Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons I think that um, School of Public Health and the Business School are working together on this, because we need our businesses and our CEOs to take on this challenge. So I want to ask you um, just a couple more questions. New Zealand. <laughs> so... This long journey has, you know, come to fruition in many ways, but mm. you don't seem to lack for new ideas. And <laughs> apparently you've got something going on in New Zealand. Mm. Why New Zealand and what are you doing? Yeah, my <laughs> wife's four least favorite words from me are, I have an idea. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, so as I just implied, this is a macroeconomic discussion as well as anything else. And I'm Really gratified being in New Hampshire, where all, you know the presidential candidates all take out our trash these days. And I mean, you know, we our line in New Hampshire is we don't vote for anyone whose hand we haven't shaken twice. But they're, they're talking about these issues, right? They're talking about soil carbon sequestration and toxification and preventative health care and so on. So that's all very exciting. Um, I was in a film called Food Inc., which maybe folks have seen. And I, had, I was invited uh, by a government agency in New Zealand about 12 years ago to go over and show it. And what I discovered in visiting New Zealand is that you have this little country with 5 million people that um, actually much of the world really looks at. And we look at the assault weapon ban that they I enacted within five days of a tragedy. And you, you, you see what I'm talking about. Um, it's a still very agricultural country, very dependent on exports. And what I saw was a country that was under enormous pressure to bring in GMOs, uh, genetically engineered foods and crops. And I neglected to mention before that the, the, the reason that all these herbicides are in the rain, as the U.S. Geological Survey shows us, is the explosion of herbicide-tolerant crops that have been genetically engineered. That's actually been, I'm not 
anti-GMO per se, but I'm anti the way that genetic engineering has been used, which is to provide more crops out there that, that really require the use of chemicals. And it shouldn't surprise us, these are the chemical companies that are, own these seeds. So I was, I've been watching the pressures building on New Zealand, and I realized, gee, in this little country, uh, and I come from a little state where I know you, know, you can have a bigger impact, um, we really, it's a sort of a perfect incubator to demonstrate the role that organic can play in the world. The, the great news in the U.S. is organics today is um, a close to $60 billion sector. Um, the bad news is we're only about 5.5% of U.S. food, and even worse, we're about 1.5% of U.S. cropland. And so with New Zealand being this very agricultural country, surrounded by these Asian countries that have destroyed their ecosystems, China and so forth, um, there's a real premium on, on New Zealand green. But to be truly green, you really have to be organic. I mean, you're hearing this word regenerative being thrown around. There's no regenerative agriculture without being organic. And so what I wanted to do in New Zealand, to make a long story short, is demonstrate that exactly what we've done here could become a driver of their economy. And so I, I run an annual entrepreneurship institute there. I'll be there next week. About 100 companies show up. And these are sometimes little stony fields, right? Almost pre-revenue, early stage. And we help them with marketing and selling and e-com and introduce them to US and Australian re and Chinese retailers and, and help them to basically accelerate their, essentially shorten their learning curve. Um, but I also have bought a farm there, uh, not the farm, I have bought a farm. And uh, I am converting it to organic production and setting it up as an it's going incubator. Going back to your roots, right? right? You well, know? it's an organic entrepreneurship cows? center. It's literally that. And so we're growing um, trees for honey. We're growing, uh, we have a market garden. We're doing organic lamb and, and orchard fruits and so on. And, and the idea is to incubate the next gen of, of entrepreneurs. So one of the things I want you to talk about as you sort of come back and you're paying it forward mm -hmm. with these entrepreneurs, do you have advice for young people today who see you as really their ideal? Mm -hmm. They want to say, how can I be Don't do that. like That's Gary? That's my first piece of advice. Uh, <laughs> how can I be like Gary? Mm -hmm. what, would you, what do you tell them? I'm sure you, you get this question. What advice do you have? Well, I, I get this advice. Uh, I mean, I run the same institute in Boulder, Colorado. We have 200 companies who show up. And, you know, uh, I guess I would offer two summary points here, and one I've already gave, given you, which is, uh, you know, the act of implementing change, uh, bringing a social or environmental mission to your uh, enterprise, or in this case, commercial enterprise, is, an inher is inherently an act of optimism. And that's great. But recognize that by being an optimist, you may be setting yourself up for traps. Be What I tell people to be very mercenary about this is whatever you think your revenue is going to be, have it. And whatever you think your costs are going to be, double or triple it. And you might be within reach of something real. In other words, temper your optimism with some reality. Learn, uh, in, apprentice, uh, take time, go slow. Uh, I burned a lot of capital. Ultimately, it worked out. But I have many, the, the landscape is littered with many of my friends along the way who didn't make it and who burned a lot of cash. And we, and given these problems that we're talking about today, the problems of climate and the problems of toxification, uh, we don't have decades to address these. These, these are, are emergencies now. And so we need these optimistic enterprises to be successful. So um, uh, learn, uh, watch, uh, and temper. And, and again, uh, be prudent in your, in your projecting. Uh, at the same time, the second lesson, though, that I, I hasten to add is you got to believe in, in those dreams. I mean, we, not everyone is as lucky as I was with my mother-in-law, but, um, but I find that in general, when I look across the landscape, and I've been on dozens and dozens of boards, and I invest in now 30 or more companies. I don't want my wife to know this number either, so I'll keep it like that. <laughs> she uh, knows everything. No, I don't she, know no, no, no. <laughs> actually, we've worked this out. She, she actually voluntarily does not want to know, which is great. Um, and by the way, she is hmm. her own extraordinary social She's entrepreneur been. doing Fabulous. an absolutely amazing preventative health care nonprofit called, called uh, the Anti-Cancer Lifestyle Foundation, which you should look up online. But um, uh, you know, you really, uh, I, I find when I look at the landscape, and I, especially when I look backwards, 
that um, the one quality in an entrepreneur that is absolutely key to success is determination. And it's probably the least valued and least understood and most underappreciated one, but you've got to stick with it. I mean, my story, and again, you can hear it in the podcast, you're hearing a little bit of it now, is one of just leaning in uh, no matter what. And I, 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 I tell the story in a very graphic way because there was a particular moment in 1987 that Karen will remember where we were, we, we were not, not on the verge. We were in the grave and the soil was being thrown on us. I mean, it was over. And we drove one night back from a, uh, basically a, a death sentence uh, you know, with some venture capitalists who gave us a, a, an ultimatum. And we somehow you know, climbed out of that soil and dusted ourselves off and, and got it going. And that was um, about nothing more than just raw determination. I will tell you a big part of that determination because I couldn't let my mother-in-law, my mom, and my friends down. Honestly, I, I probably would have just, you know, said, "Pile it on, I'm over." If it, w if I had had just some institutional money, but so, so but you got to you believe do in yourself. When it, with the, was all coming down, you just said, "No, we're going to try." You know, we're going to live another well, day. Well, we played this thing called Stone Soup, which you know about, which is a uh, short version, long story. I went to the Small Business Administration uh, mm -hmm. uh, the next morning and uh, said, uh, "I have got." Uh, for $592,000, I could build my own factory in London, New Hampshire. I just need an 85% loan guarantee. I got a bank willing to loan if you'll do that. That wasn't exactly true. Uh, and I said, I have investors willing to put in 20% uh, that I know you require, $100,000. Also not true. Uh, the SBA said, well, if you've got the bank and the investors, no problem. Dr I drove over, found a bank, said, listen, I got the SBA lined up for 85% <laughs> loan guarantee, and I have $100,000 of shareholder equity. And they said, sure, I'm condensing a long story. Uh, they said, sure, we'll do it. Called the shareholders the next night and said, SBA's in, bank's in, just need your 100K. And we uh, built it that way. And we, uh, so maybe the third lesson is a little exaggeration's okay. Uh, but we uh, opened our factory nine months to the date from that meeting and we became profitable six months after that. So, you know, when the chips are down, you really have to look in the mirror and say, look, do I believe in this mission? And by the way, I would maybe add that as the last lesson. Don't ever, as a consumer or as a producer or an investor, don't ever underestimate the power of mission because it drives everything. For me, it drove, it was why I got up and was excited every day and still am. And for my consumers, I think it's why they stick with us. And, and for our investors, it's why they made money. It's for my employees. It's, you know, they get, you know, the dairy business is not exactly high margin, high, you know, we don't compete with tech on compensation. Uh, but the mission keeps people retained, keeps people happy, keeps people fulfilled, and, and uh, drives a hell of a lot of great business. So I think you can see that there could be no more powerful example of um, business and mission coming together in a way that impacts uh, that our global health. Mm -hmm. And that your leadership in this and your vision from, I, I guess, 40 years of this, um, tempered by hard work, uh, some loyal people who stuck with you, um, but really led and by a superior this, product. And Let's a not superior, forget that. And a superior that. product. A superior organic, great tasting, wonderful product. Um, but really, this is, uh, I think, the magic uh, cocktail that we need more of. And we're fortunate in this country that it, it is the land of entrepreneurship and the American dream. So my hope is that people who are listening, people who are here today, might take this on, that we can see pathways where we can grow important businesses and make a difference in the world. Thank you, Gary. Please join me in thanking mm -hmm. Gary for being such a great example and coming here. Thank you very much.